Good morning or afternoon, depending on where you are. This is Scott Sanford. I'm with the University of Wisconsin. Uh, and I'm the moderator and coordinator for this uh, Refueling Wisconsin Wood Energy series. Um, so I got a couple of housekeeping things before we get started. Uh, one is if you're on in uh, uh, voice issues, uh, you can do it two ways. One, you can uh, do a voice over internet, and you follow these directions here. Uh, or what we recommend is you do a, a phone, and it's a better connection. Uh, and that would be the, the phone line that uh, was given to you. So um, it's a 1-800 number. If somebody needs it, I can uh, uh, find it quick and get it to you. Um, the other thing uh point out just from this one, over here there's a bunch of uh, buttons. And this first one is for a poll. We're not going to do a poll this morning, but uh, that's her poll. But if you have a question or something, uh, you can raise your hand. Uh, the chat box is down here where you can type in a question if you uh, have a question. And uh, we will uh, um, try to answer it for you. Uh, we may hold off until the end, but just uh, so you know where that's, that stuff is. <coughs> So that we're going to get. Uh, oh, so yeah. So here's here's the three buttons. So we've got a, uh, faces and uh, hands up, et cetera. So I just want to go quick over that. So we're going to start this morning. Uh, we're going to do economics today. So we're going to look at economic analysis. I'm going to try to take you through um, nothing in real uh, depth, but we're going to look at uh, you know how you do a feasibility study or at least the process, uh, kind of a cost checklist, what we should include. Um, then um, kind of a, a slide on how do we pick uh, which uh, type of fuel we're going to use. And some of that has to do with size. So we've got uh, kind of a rule of thumb, but it's not a very hard, fast rule. And most of the time we're going to take and we're going to look at some tools that are available for doing the analysis. And in doing that, I'm going to work through an example. And then uh, we'll talk about grants and loans. And with us today is, is uh, Lisa Nolte, uh, Nolte from um, uh, USDA Rural Energy, or not Rural Energy, she does energy work, but uh, Rural Development to talk about REAP grants, which are probably the grant that most of us will use unless you're involved with a community or mis 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 yeah, municipality. So the first thing, let's go through uh, kind of the rapid assessment. How do you figure out what you need or, or, or what you're going to do for this? So the first um, point on this is you've got to figure out what your heating needs. Now, typically, we can go to our heating bills and look at those and get some quantities of heat we're using. Um, but we also need to know the efficiency of the appliance. Um, because if we're changing from one fuel to another, the efficiencies often change. Um, so we, we need to know that. So you can either look at the specifications of the, the appliance you're using now, or you may have to get it tested. If it's an older unit, it's probably good to have it tested uh, to see what that efficiency would be. And then we can calculate the usable heat. And that's going to be uh, the quantity of heat times the BTUs per unit uh, times the efficiency. So my example here, if we use 2,500 gallons of LP gas, uh, with a boiler efficiency of 75%. Um, my, uh, um, so it's 2,500 gallons times the heat per, um, or the BTUs per unit, which that's what this little box up here has, uh, a list of the, the common fuels, uh, times my uh, efficiency, which is going to give me uh, 171, 172 uh, million BTUs per year that we're going to use. So that's the first number that we need to have. Next, we need to choose uh, what fuel we're going to replace it with and the type of appliance. Um, so we need to know the energy content of that fuel. And with wood, often we need to measure it. Or if you're buying pellets, it'll be part of the specification on the pellets. And then we need to know the system, uh, heating system efficiency. Um, so for this. Um, we're going to use uh, the usable heat, which is that's at 171 or 172 million BTUs. 
divided by the energy content of my new fuel, the replacement fuel, and the efficiency of that replacement uh, heater, the wood heater. So here's an example. We've got some wood pellets. Uh, the specification 8,400 BTUs per pound, boiler efficiency of 80%. Uh, so we've got our 171 and change in uh, BTUs needed. Uh, we're going to divide that by uh, 8,400 BTUs per pound and divided by the, the efficiency. And that's going to give me pounds, and I've converted that to about 25,000 pounds. I converted that to tons because that's typically if we're going to buy it in bulk, uh, that kind of quantity, you, you probably wouldn't mess around with bags. You'd go bulk. Um, so it's about 13 tons of pellets we'd need to replace that uh, amount of heat. Um, so that's that gets us now to our 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 fuel. Uh, what we can do. So we can next thing we do, need to do is to get a fuel quote, and then we can calculate savings. So um, my LP gas was uh, I think two dollars a gallon is what I uh, had it at. Um, I missed that at, on an earlier slide. Um, or maybe it wasn't. Maybe it was a little less. Than, it was too less than that. It's probably dollar seventy-five or dollar eighty. So I got forty-eight hundred or yeah, forty-eight seventy-five in cost for my LP gas. My wood is going to be uh, my twelve point eight times two hundred um, dollars per ton. It's going to be twenty-six twenty-five sixty. So I subtract the two, and I'm going to get a savings per year. Of 2315, so that's the money I have to pay for any investment uh, that I'm going to to uh, do. So that has to cover the equipment cost um, of converting from uh, to a different fuel. Um, so some of the costs that um, are going to be involved with with this, um, we're going to have the cost of the appliance, uh, chimney, or vent. Uh, sometimes that's included with the cost of appliance. Sometimes it's separate. Um, we're going to have uh, electrical connections. We're going to have plumbing. Uh, most of the time it's boiler, not a furnace. Um, we're going to fuel storage. So um, you know, even if you're um, uh, just doing um, uh, wood pellets in a bag, you still have, to have a place to put them. Um, then we have accessory equipment. We probably need some cleaning equipment. If we've got heavy stuff, we need a fork truck or a loader. Uh, conveyors, augers, ash disposal, and on large projects, we're likely going to have engineering fees. So somebody has to figure out what size uh, everything has to be to fit together, and there'll be permits, um, especially larger issues. Even if it's a small um, um, unit, you still may have a building permit that you need in order to uh, put that up, especially if it's got electrical. Uh, work involved with it. Um, so the first question, kind of looking at this, is: Is my fuel savings positive? If, if it's negative, uh, then it's a non-starter. <clears throat> You're not going to do it. And then the second question is: What's my simple payback? <clears throat> is it uh, um, less than the equipment life? So simple payback is investment cost over the annual savings. So if I look at all those costs that I just had in the previous slide um, and divide that by my savings, um, is, is uh, that you know if it's 10 years, is the equipment going to last 10 years? Um, if it is less, then the next thing you do is a cash flow analysis uh, or other kind of financial analysis to see if it fits your build business or finances. Because um, one of the problems with with simple payback is that it doesn't account for things like annual costs, repairs, inflations, uh, inflation, uh, fuel cost escalation, um, labor. Um, so all those kinds of things we you know we're just kind of doing a back of the envelope thing right at the moment. So then you need to bring some of that stuff in. Another way to look at this. To bring in some of those other costs is what we call equivalent annual cost. So this uses discount and interest rate, the life of, of the equipment or the payback period for if it's a loan, to calculate the annual cost of ownership. 
Um, so it's equivalent annual cost um, is equal to the net present value um, times the the uh, capital recovery rate, and that's based on um, the years of life or the length of the loan and the discount rate. And typically, this is looked up in a table, although you can calculate it. Uh, so here's an example. I've got my capital cost of $100,000. Uh, it's 20-year life at 7%. I've got $2,000 a year in maintenance costs. And I'm going to assume that the, at the end of the project, the salvage value is zero. Now, if it had a salvage value, you'd actually subtract that from your initial capital cost. Um, because at the end of 20 years, that would be what you'd sell it for. I'm going to assume it's zero, just to keep it simple. So uh, I take my it's my $100,000 from net, my pre net present value times the capital recovery number, which I've looked up in a table, um, plus my annual cost. So that's going to give give it $11,440 a year is what it's going to cost me to own this piece of equipment. Um, now, sometimes you want to do a little different analysis because uh, this um, your maintenance cost may may go up as it gets older, so you may want to bring in some escalation costs and stuff uh, to that. To that. Now, the other thing you have to add is is the fuel cost to this to get my total annual cost um, uh, for this project. Although the fuel cost is not um, uh, you know, if you're you're looking at a, a payback, you wouldn't normally use that in in that because that's a that's a that's a cost you're going to have anyway. So here's some of the other costs that uh, I, I already covered some of these, but uh, we might have to do a feasibility study. We might have to hire somebody to do that. We've got engineering analysis for larger projects. We've got permits, uh, equipment costs, uh, freight costs can be you know if, if something has to be freighted across the country, that's going to add to our cost. A lot of times, that's that's cut, uh, that's um, quoted in, in with the equipment cost. Then I've got my installation cost, uh, commissioning. Um, sometimes, uh, if it's a boiler or something, you may have inspections and stuff that are required. Um, if it's a high pressure boiler, um, building inspections, things like that, that may have additional costs. And then, then I've got um, you know my annual maintenance and you know, I might have want some repair parts on hand, uh, so that might be be another cost uh, to to actually have some inventory of parts, because uh, these heating units or wood appliances aren't like a, you know a gas oil furnace have been around for years and the parts are readily available. You know, you can probably make a few phone calls and find the parts you need. Uh, so, wood chips, pellets. Or logs, which do I, do I pick? Well, it's going to depend on the capacity. If it's a smaller system, we're probably going to pick our logs or or pellets. Might be availability. Um, you know, um, wood chips might be nice, but uh, they may be too far away uh, for the cost of, of uh, trucking them. Uh, do I have labor? If I'm going to use cordwood, do I have the labor to get up in the middle of the night to uh, load this load the uh, boiler to keep it going? Uh, storage. Do I have storage for uh, fuel? Um, the capital cost that also brings into it. Emissions requirement. Um, cordwood tends to have higher uh, amount of particulate emissions. Um, in some parts of, of the state, uh, there may be requirements for uh, um, uh, filtering some of that stuff out. Uh, fuel cost. You know. Has to do with with um, you know how much how much could it be, and then truck access, and especially if we're using chips or logs and we have a large facility. Um, do we have room for a tractor trailer to get in, um, and room to store a truckload of material at a time? Um, the U.S. Forest Service uh, they've been doing projects like this for quite a number of years, and one of their recommendations is. If you're using less than than um, um, 3,500 uh, gallons of, of L, uh, propane or 25 or 2250 gallons of of fuel oil, and that's about 3 billion um, BTUs of energy per year, 
Um, pellets or wood, cordwood is is probably your best bet. If you're greater than that, then it could be any of the three. Um, and just for reference, um, uh, this 3,500 gallons, that's about 200 tons of, of uh, wood pellets, or about, uh, I think it's like 150 uh, cords of wood, uh, roughly, just to give you an idea what that size requirement is. Um, some of the other, there's some other recommendations out there that it's about uh, 3 million um, BTUs per hour um, that uh, you'd use wood chips and under that you'd use uh, pellets, but that's not a hard and fast rule um, because we've got uh, wood chip boilers in some uh, schools around the state and some of them are less than the 3 million BTUs. So next thing I want to do is talk about uh, some tools that are out there that uh, you can use to help with this analysis. First thing I'm going to talk about is um, Michigan Wood Energy Calculator. Uh, it was developed by the uh, Southeast Michigan uh, RCMD. And then we'll talk about one that was developed at the University of Minnesota. And then uh, um, a tool out of Canada called Red Screen, which uh, can do some really uh, complicated analysis. So the Michigan Wood Energy Tool is, has at least a number of inputs. So it's kind of handy in that regard. Um, you need some contact information, location. And in this case, your location is going to be out of state because it's set up for just Michigan. So you're going to pick the out of state uh, tab. Um, it asks you for type of facility. I'm not sure what the, the model actually does for that. Um, but uh, it is something to ask for. Uh, boiler size, which you can usually get off the side of a boiler. Um, ask for your current type of fuel and fuel price and annual fuel use. And then um, the cost of, it says green wood, but basically the cost of whatever wood you're going to use. So it could be pellets or, or wood chips is basically what this tool looks at. Um, it doesn't um, doesn't look at at uh, cordwood, and then you have to have a financing rate. So some of the assumptions uh, it it, it um, for out of state it never uh, looks at uh, any grants. Um, it looks at ten years of financing um, for wood chips. It's basically a, a capacity greater than three million uh, BTUs per hour. For wood pellets, it's going to be less than that, less than or equal to. And it portions out the fuel as 95% of it's going to be your wood and 5% your current fuel. Um, last week we talked that sometimes uh, going less than that is optimal. The other thing it does is it looks at the wood boiler as size at half the size of your existing boiler because um, a lot of boilers are oversized to begin with. And what it's trying to do there is not to get it too big so it, it uh, runs more continuously um, uh, to supply heat. So here's, uh, it's a little tough to see, um, but here's what the, the output, this is a sample output. And they, they uh, email you the results too. So every time you do one of these analysis, you'll get an email. Um, but um, here it has existing, this is the existing fuel. So this was using 10,000 um, gallons of, of propane, uh, $2 a gallon. And then this was my uh, uh, fuel, let's see. So this is uh, $20,000. It's going to use 11,200 uh, for my wood and $1,000 for uh, the current fuel. And basically, it's what it's looking at is there's times in the spring and fall when you might need a few hours of heat. You can't justify going out and starting up a stove. Um, then it has some additional costs and stuff in here. Um, and up on top here, it's uh, it's estimated the cost of the system be $59,100. Um, and then this would be my annual um, Finance costs, which would be the principal plus interest. Uh, so that gives you gives you an idea of what it is. And in this case, it's a, a negative uh, annual cash flow. 
uh, so it's maybe not something you want to do. The um, next tool, and, and the, the Michigan tool is an older tool. Um, it probably has some older uh, uh, data, and so it estimates the cost of the system cost for you. Um, it doesn't allow you to put the cost in. So this next tool uh, kind of is the next step up. It has more detailed inputs. Uh, it can model the estimated capital costs, although this tool overestimates small systems. So anything under a million BTUs per hour, uh, it tends to overestimate it. Um, but I talked to the author uh, <clears throat> in the last few days, and they're working on a revision that's going to uh, have uh, better estimation of costs for small systems because they recognize that that's a problem. <clears throat> um, so this one here's um, what the uh, basically the input uh, screen looks like. So you can uh, you can pick your fuels. You put your two fuels in, um, and here in annual usage, you can pick any of these. Um, so I'm all these examples are going to that I'm showing you are going to have 10,000 gallons per year roughly. Uh, so that's what I put in. You can pick a conventional boiler. Um, geez, I don't remember what the other kind is. Um, maybe it was high. I don't think it was high efficiency. Maybe it was high efficiency. Um, one of the disadvantages I see with this tool is that these numbers are uh, the, the efficiencies are fixed, uh, so you you can't really change them. You can, however, change the amount of substitute. Uh, so whether you want 100% or 80%. Um, of the new system to deliver the fuel, um, so that's that's a nice feature. Um, it's going to be either pellets or 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 wood chips. It does set the the efficiency, so you can't change that. Then down here is a fuel type. So you put in your moisture, um, your green cost. So that's what you're going to buy it for. It's going to calculate out the dry ton cost based on um, your moisture. Um, and then it's going to it's going to calculate yeah your cost and your your amount of propane you're going to use. Um, I already covered this, but just talking about the the fact that it doesn't uh, allow you to um, change those. So then this is a capital cost one, and you can see this is for the same size system basically, uh, and it it um, it has a, um, if you check this it's model driven and it, it brings in its own cost. So the other cost was about $59,000, and this one's saying it's $208,000. And this is uh, it's calculating that it needs um, uh, $200,000 um, per hour, 200, yeah, 200,000 BTUs per hour uh, uh, heater. And and I know that's not going to cost that much. It's probably um, you know a quarter, an eighth of that cost total. Um, so that's why I knew this was was up. But this does allow you to put in, um, you know, other costs here: um, uh, costs for hookups, uh, costs for piping, um, etc. So it does allow you to stick some of those other uh, building. You know, if you had to build a building uh, for that, so you can you can put in all your costs here. So what I recommend until they get the update is if you're doing a small system, get the quote for the system. Um, then come in here and, and um, um, you uncheck that, and then you can put in your your cost. And we'll try to. I'm going to try to over the next month or so try to get some uh, some estimates on costs, um, so that we can do that. Uh, give you, give some better ideas. So in this case, this is the uh, cash flow screen. Um, here's where you put your interest rate, your span of life, which is Either your span of life or your your uh, loan length, depending on how you want to calculate it out. Um, then it um, it brings some of these costs in, but you can you can actually change these here if you want to look at how how, for instance, uh, the cost of one of these two fuels will affect your cash flow. Um, in this case, so in this case, uh, we probably wouldn't do this, but um, it does do a nice job of very simply uh, uh, putting all this information together. 
The next tool uh, is a little more complex. Um, it actually works. It's a uh, Excel spreadsheet, uh, and it's climate driven. So it brings in climate data um, to, to calculate your heat loads. Uh, so that's that's a nice feature of it. Um, you know, if you're doing something like a greenhouse or something like that, you can bring that in. It does have the ability to do uh, uh, district heating type things, and it has some case studies in it and some templates. There's very few defaults here, so you really have to know your numbers. Where some of the other tools that I've talked about so far have defaults, so you can kind of run through those tools and and play with them and get an idea. This tool you you really have to know what you're doing. So this is the opening screen here, and, and some of the important features here, you have to uh, pick what type of project, uh, the technology you want to use, and the analysis method. Method one is going to be more like the analysis we've looked at in the Michigan and the, the um, Minnesota tool. Then you have to pick the uh, your location. Um, so you, you click this link, and you, you pick the location. What that does is it brings in the weather data for the area you're going to to look at. Um, then this is the first window yet. So already, I, some people probably roll their eyes because this is it's more complicated. But you put in uh, um, I'm just going to give you a thing. So you put in the the uh, floor area. You've got to put in the heating load uh, of the building per square foot, uh, and then it calculates out the the, the fuel cost. On, on these, on this tool, anything yellow is an input. Um, uh, gray is is an optional input. Um, so know, knowing that you have to, to figure. So here's what I put in. I've got propane, um, my efficiencies of it. Here's biomass and my efficiencies of it. Um, it uh, uh, let's see. The size of the system, the cost of the system. So you've got to know all that to, to begin with. Here's uh, for backup. They call it peaking, but that would be my backup heat um, uh, right there. And then the uh, next screen uh, does a financial analysis, um, and you've got some. some you get some inflation costs you can put in here. Um, Debt ratio, so I've got this at 100% um, financed. Uh, your interest rate, uh, you can put in some other costs here. I've got some maintenance costs, $2,000 maintenance cost, um, and it goes through. And, and one thing, it does give you a little graph here to kind of uh, show you what's going on. Um, so that's that's for method A. Method two on this tool. Um, it actually does a load analysis, so it does it heating by month. Um, you can do multiple buildings, uh, multiple fuels, has an uh, emissions analysis, as well as what we've talked about. Plus, it has uh, sensitivity and risk analysis. So I'll run through those screens. So this would be your your uh, initial input screen. Um, so I've got if I want multiple fuels, I pick them here. I've got a single fuel. Um, the type of heat. Uh, this is my proposed. Um, let's see. Oh, so that's my base. Oh, that's my peaking. I have to look at it. it's it's small on my too. So that's my peaking. Um, and then it does give you a little graph here to show what um, what things are going to look like. I'm going to get to the next screen. This is my cost analysis. Um, Again, it kind of goes through. So one of the things about this tool is a lot of stuff is by unit cost. Um, so when you put your costs in here, you have to look and see what the units are over here. Now, most of these units you can change. Uh, it'll come in metric because that's what they use in Canada, but you, most of them you can change to English units. Um, but you can see it's much more uh, um, complex. Here's a, a financial, so this is a, a cost flow analysis. Um, so here's my daily cost flow, uh, pre-tax and, and after-tax, uh, to let you you see what uh, things are going to look like. And then this uh, this kind of nice uh, for risk analysis, and you can change these. So 
I got my base fuel versus my initial cost here. Uh, and you can change the range. Uh, up here you can change the maximum range of the sensitivity. Uh, so you can look at what ifs, you know, is my my uh, uh, internal rate of return, which is IRR, is that going to stay positive if I, you know, if my costs, how much can my costs vary before it goes negative? So those are the what ifs you can do with sensitivity analysis. And then they have a risk analysis, which is, is set up a little differently, but um, does similar thing. So I want to do a cost comparison. Basically, I, my two dollars a gallon for propane, ten thousand gallons a year, eighty percent efficient, um, with a, a capacity of three hundred thousand BTUs per hour. And then I would replacing it with with a pellet stove at two hundred dollars per ton, five percent interest, ninety five and five percent um, for ten year financing. Um, so just to kind of show you what the, these do, as I said, the Minnesota tool was way off because the initial cost was off. Uh, but the other two tools uh, gave me uh, similar uh, paybacks and um, similar, they all gave about the same energy savings. Uh, so just to kind of show you how comparison uh, they are to give some confidence in the, in the tools. Now the Minnesota tool, if you put in your own costs, then it should be right in line with the others. Um, some resources. Um, there's a, um, a community biomass uh, handbook that uh, you might find uh, useful for resources. This is an online. Um, it's actually um, at the University of Minnesota website. And then some other resources. Uh, um, these are some other ones. Mostly these, these all come from the biomasscenter.org uh, that might give you some, some uh, information about wood pellets and, and wood chip. And uh, then they have one that looks at schools. So if anybody's looking at a bigger facility, that might be um, a good one to use. Now let's go to grants and incentives. Um, so first we have uh, Wisconsin. If you're living in Wisconsin, um, Wisconsin Focus on Energy has grants available um, for renewable energy, although there's been very few projects on the biomass side, aside from anaerobic digesters that have been funded. And one of the issues here is that you have to be on their system with natural gas. Uh, and if you already use natural gas, wood's going to be more expensive. So that's probably not an option for most people. Um, one of the probably best sources for, for grant funding is uh, the Rural Energy for America program, REAP, which we're gonna, our next speaker is going to talk about. Um, but there are some others that um, we'll probably see if we can get somebody to talk about in the future. Um, but they're community-based or business-based uh, things. So there's a community facilities, uh, direct loan uh, um, or loan guarantees, and uh, business and industry. Uh, Loan guarantee. So those might be others, some others for bigger projects or community municipality type projects. Um, the others, the Forest Service has some some grants. So they have, if we've got a project that uh, just needs some final engineering work, uh, they have a grant program that uh, um, can supply some funding for uh, engineering type work to get projects off the ground. And then they also um, offer help with feasibility studies uh, at no cost. Um, so that's if you're interested in either of these two. Well, if you're interested in the first one, you can go to this website. If you're interested in the second one, uh, contact me, and I'll send you an application to fill out. Because uh, we do the first pass on those and then send them on to the Forest Service. All right, with that, I'm going to hand this over to uh, um, Lisa, to uh, talk about the REAP grant. Lisa, Thank you, are you Scott. There? Good afternoon, everyone. Um, just a little bit of background on uh, the Rural Energy for America program and uh, USDA. Um, the program was first established in the 2002 Farm Bill. It was amended in the 2008 Farm Bill, and it added a feasibility study component. 
Um, then the 2014 Farm Bill reauthorized it, provided $50 million uh, worth of funding per year, eliminated the feasibility study component, uh, but then added a three-tier application process. So we now have um, two components to REAP. One is the side that we do the actual projects, what we call the Renewable Energy System and Energy Efficiency Improvement side. And then the um, Energy Audit and Renewable Energy Development Assistance uh, side. So um, the Energy Audit, Renewable Energy Development Assistance uh, side uh, just closed. It closed February uh, 12th. And we are working on those applications. And that's the side that provides um, audits and uh, resource assessments to ag producers and small businesses to help them make the decisions about moving forward with projects that uh, they may be considering. So um, the purpose um, kind of of this uh, webinar is to focus on the renewable energy um, systems and energy efficiency improvements. Primarily, uh, this presentation will focus on the uh, renewable energy side. Um, get my slides going here. There we go. Um, so looking at the renewable energy system, uh, energy efficiency improvement side, uh, the purpose of that um, part of REAP is to assist rural small businesses and ag producers in the purchase and installation of renewable energy systems and energy efficiency improvements. And we can do that with um, a, a couple of types of assistance. Um, we can do guaranteed loans, um, which are loans that are originated through lenders, and then they do the um, package up, do the analysis, and then they bring it to us for loan guarantees. Uh, we have a grant side. Um, in the grant side, we have a set aside for 20000 or less. Um, the Farm Bill actually wants to make sure that smaller uh, pro, uh, projects you know, don't get crowded out by large uh, projects. So they have set aside um, so much money each year that's restricted to those 20000 or less projects. And then we have um, kind of the rest of the grant funds that are unrestricted. Um, and then we have guaranteed loan and grant combinations. So projects that want to use guaranteed loans, but they also maybe want to uh, compete for grants um, have an option of, of providing a combination application. Uh, for 2015, the funding looks like um, this. Uh, we're actually um, delivering 2014 and 2015 funds in 15. Uh, because of the changes in the Farm Bill, uh, we needed to make some regulatory changes, which we just got uh, completed. So we, um, we were able to hold the 2014 uh, funds to administer when we had those changes ready to go. So uh, we will have two years' worth of funding in 2015. Guaranteed loan funds, uh, we have approximately 20 million. Uh, we are very interested in projects that have the ability to utilize our guaranteed loan funds. That's kind of a new focus for this program, and uh, we are uh, very interested in getting that uh, piece rolling. So any projects that have the potential for guaranteed loans, uh, we definitely want to, to be talking. So. The set aside for 20,000 or less uh, is 10 million dollars for 2015, and then the uh, grants that are unrestricted, any any size of grant can compete for that is 68 million. Um, the majority of these funds, or at least all the grant funds, are um, administered through state allocations. So we have a formula that Congress um, has given to us that decides how much uh, money each state will get using a long, complex formula. Uh, but the majority of, of the grant funds are allocated out to the states, and then the states conduct competitions and uh, utilize that, their funding. Applicants who are applying uh, as rural small businesses uh, will qualify by demonstrating that they fall within uh, the Small Business Administration small business size standard using either the NAICS code 
um, which stands for North American Industry Classification System, or by an alternative size standard, which is um, is new to the program this year. Um, the NAICS code thresholds are, usual, are either, usually either tied to that business's annual receipts or the number of employees. But for a business to be eligible, they would have to be under that NAICS code established for that industry, or um, they could possibly use the alternative size standard, which SBA also uses um, to demonstrate their eligibility. So. Um, the alternative size standard allows for a maximal, maximum tangible net worth of not more than 15 million and an average net income of not more than 5 million. So either way, um, an applicant could uh, demonstrate their eligibility through either the NAICS code or the alternative size standard. Or they may be eligible to apply as an agriculture producer. Um, and an agriculture producer is someone who is directly engaged in the production of agriculture products, whereby they receive 50% or greater of their gross income from agriculture products. So um, either ag, uh, rural small businesses or ag producers are eligible to apply. Um, applicants need to own or control the site in which they are proposing to install the project or to make the improvements to. Um, they're expected to have sufficient revenue and expenses available for the proposed project. They're expected to have the legal authority necessary to apply for and carry out the project. And then um, the registration number, uh, which is what we commonly refer to as um, a SAM or CAGE code, um, is a registration process that all grant applicants have to go through and maintain until uh, the grant is paid out. Technical merit, which ties in very closely to um, the information that Scott was uh, sharing earlier, um, is going to look at you know the um, technical merit of the government making the investment in the project. And one of the first things we look at when we're looking at technical merit is the project needs to be commercially available. So um, when we look at what do we mean with commercially available, uh, it means that a system has a proven operating history and proven performance data. It's based on established design and installation procedures and is replicable. That there are professional service providers who are familiar with the installation procedures. That services available to properly maintain and operate the system and spare parts are available. Um, and that there's a valid warranty within the United States. A second option uh, new this year is that we can demonstrate commercially, um, commercial availability if we have a certification from a recognized organization. And um, this is uh, primarily maybe the WIND, um, Small Wind Certification Council, uh, American Wind Energy Association, Solar Rating and Certification Corporation, Florida Solar Energy Center, um, but um, making sure that we have proven technologies. Um, the program in the past has done pre-commercial, but with the new rule, uh, we went uh, commercially available. So. Um, so again, commercial availability works into uh, the analysis of technical merit. Uh, technical merit is where we get into the details of the project. Um, it includes a detailed explanation of the project and how it ties into the operation, uh, the qualifications of those that have been identified to do the work. Um, if we have an energy efficiency, it needs an audit that supports the energy savings. If it's a renewable energy system, then it needs a resource assessment to analyze the resources that it's going to take to convert the energy and support um, the energy projections. Um, in determining technical merit, we also look at information on whether the equipment is available, the timeline that's being proposed to develop the project, and with this information, we make a determination on technical merit. 
Um, so as we look at these items, we'll either pass or fail uh, the technical merit review. And projects that fail cannot move forward to compete. We have to have technical merit. It's one of the eligibility criteria for a project to be able to compete for funds. So looking at the various uh, technologies, we're kind of focused here today on bioenergy. Um, that could include pellet mills, biomass burners, ethanol and biodiesel facilities, uh, anaerobic digesters, uh, facilities that use animal or food waste to produce methane and then convert the methane to electricity, uh, geothermal. Uh, hydrogen derived from a renewable source, uh, solar, wind, hydroelectric, hybrids that utilize uh, uh, two or more sources of renewable energy systems uh, but tie together, and then of course energy efficiency improvements. So we've kind of touched on applicant eligibility and project eligibility. Um, so then we'll move into kind of um, what it takes to put a project together. Um, we talked about the new Farm Bill um, opening up the three tiers of applications. Um, so that is going to um, determine um, or what's going to determine which of the three tiers we're going to look at is going to be the project cost. So we're going to look at the costs associated with the project and then how they fall within these, these guidelines. If we have a system with total project costs of 80000 or less, we're using one application tier. If our project is less than 200 but more than 80, we will use a second tier. And then if it's uh, 2000 or greater, we'll use that third tier. Um, so we're looking at all the costs associated with the project. And um, the other thing we'll just check in on here is uh, renewable energy systems that have total project costs of 200000 or greater are required to have a feasibility study as part of the application. Um, and all applications of 200000 or greater will have uh, financial information tied to them. So that's part of the application process. Um, we take applications year-round, but um, there are deadlines because we have grants and we um, need to be able to compete the grants. There are windows that have been established for uh, the grant funds um, to compete in the first round of grant funds, April 30th, and the second round is June 30th. So that's 2015. Uh, moving into 2016, um, the application dates are hardwired into the new guideline. Uh, so, at, so for 2016 and beyond, they'll be April 30th and October 30th. A few more things that are um, tied to the program, the maximum amount of grant assistance is 750000 uh, Grants can cover a maximum of 25% of the total project cost. Um, there's minimums and maximums that go with both renewable energy and energy efficiency systems. So renewable energy, the minimum grant is uh, $2,500. So you need a system that costs uh, at least um, $10,000 and then the maximum grant is 500000 Energy efficiency, the minimum grant is $1,500, so you need a project that costs at least 6000 and the maximum grant is uh, $250,000. Uh, guaranteed loan uh, and combination applications, that's where you're applying for a grant and a guaranteed loan, can cover up to 75% of the project costs. The minimum guaranteed loan is 5000 and the max is uh, $25 million. Uh, a few more things that are helpful to know. Uh, we only cover um, post only uh, post-application expenses are eligible, not pre-application. Only post-application expenses are eligible. Um, it is a reimbursement grant, so applicants need to uh, know that they will have to uh, pay for the system and then supply the documentation, and then we release the grant funds. Um, 
there's a grant agreement that goes with the projects. Uh, before we disperse funds, we enter into a grant agreement. And one of the things that's tied into the grant agreement are reporting requirements. Um, we report to Congress and they assess the um, feasibility of the program by the amount of energy that we generate uh, with our projects and the amount of energy savings. So that's where the reporting requirements come in um, that applicants report out on projects. Energy efficiency reports out for two full years after the project's completed and renewable energy systems report out for three years. Uh, guaranteed loans, we kind of touched on guaranteed loans being um, a new component, um, looking at uh, you know, some aggressive marketing with the guaranteed loans. So you know, if anyone has any information uh, on projects that are interested in guaranteed loans, um, anyone wants to talk through that any further, uh, by all means, uh, talk to Brenda and I. Uh, Brenda, is the, uh, Brenda Heinen is the energy coordinator there in Wisconsin. Uh, we have energy coordinators uh, located in each state. Um, so if you happen to not be in Wisconsin, we can hook you up with the uh, appropriate coordinator. Um, I actually coordinate throughout the Midwest, so um, I can uh, also find those names or, or help provide information. But uh, again, you know, we're, we're interested in guaranteed loans. Um, the maximum uh, amount, or excuse me, the minimum amount on a guaranteed loan is five thousand. Um, maximum is twenty five million. Um, the guaranteed loans have thresholds based on the amount uh, that they're applying for. Um, loans of six hundred thousand or less can receive uh, guarantees of up to eighty five percent. That's a percentage of loss. So if a lender liquidated a loan and had a loss, the government would come in and, and pay 85% of the loss is, is kind of what that's referring to. Uh, again, guaranteed loans, working capital can be uh, seven years, machinery and equipment, 15 years, or the useful life. Uh, real estate can go uh, 30 years. Interest rates can be fixed or variable, uh, just as long as they don't adjust more often than quarterly. Uh, primarily, the interest rate is, is a uh, tool negotiated between the lender and the borrower. So uh, what can it do for the actual borrowers, um, kind of assist in providing the stability uh, and growth through energy efficiency improvements and renewable energy utilization? Uh, it provides the ability to receive higher loan amounts. Um, a lot of lenders have um, uh, loan limits uh, that this provides some relief with. Uh, we talked about competitive interest rates since there's less risk. Uh, tied with the project, and then uh, longer repayment terms. So some, some attractive things that uh, guaranteed loans can bring. Um, I want to touch on scoring. Um, since it is uh, a competitive process, primarily the grants are, are in a very competitive environment, uh, just to touch on, on how we evaluate projects, uh, how they compete. There's seven categories uh, for a maximum of 100 uh, points. Projects will either be scored as combination loans and grants, guaranteed loans, or uh, pure grants. So the first category is um, energy generated, replaced, or saved. There's a maximum of 25 points in this uh, category. It's actually broken down into two subcategories. So uh, the first category is the energy um, generated or saved per REAP dollar invested. And there's a maximum of 10 points in this uh, criteria. It's prorated. Um, it's based on the projected total amount of energy generation or savings. And we convert that all to BTUs divided by the REAP dollar that's being requested. If a project scores less than 50,000 BTUs per loan or grant dollar, um, a portion of the 10 points is applied based on the formula um, and prorated out. If the uh, system produces greater than 50,000 BTUs per grant dollar um, awarded, then it gets the full 10 points. 
the second uh, criteria is um, replacement, um, energy savings uh, generation or replacement, which primarily in this webinar we'd be looking at replacement, uh, which is where we get into most of the projects that are self-use. Um, if the replacement is zero to up to 25 percent, it's five points. Uh, 25 or greater up to 50 percent is 10 points, and then uh, over 50 is 15 points. Uh, the second criteria is environmental benefits. Um, if a project can demonstrate that it's contributing to resource conservation, either water, soil, or forest, uh, public health, uh, potable water, or air quality, or the environment, which is where we look at compliance with EPA's renewable fuel standard, greenhouse gas emissions, or particulate matter. Um, if the project uh, has a positive impact on one of the three areas, it gets one point. Uh, if it has a positive impact on any two of the three, it gets three points. And then if it has a positive impact on all three, then it gets five points. Uh, commitment of funds, uh, that's basically the demonstration that an applicant has their portion of the funds uh, committed if the government makes the investment uh, in the project. So we're looking for actual written commitments uh, very specific to the project, specific to the, the terms that are being uh, offered. So uh, the fourth one then is size of the applicant producer or rural small business. There's a maximum of 10 points uh, for this criteria. And it's based on the size of the applicant's agricultural operation or business concern as it's compared to the SBA size standard um, NAICS code. So um, if it's a third or less than the maximum size standard, it gets the full 10 points. If it's greater than a third up to and including two-thirds of the maximum size, it gets five points and then larger than two-thirds of the size, it would get uh, zero. So just an example of what we're talking here, um, most ag producer um, NAICS codes are limited to 750000 in annual receipts. If we had an ag producer with annual receipts of, say, 400000 we would take the 400000 divide it by the 750000 and you'd get 0.533. So that's more than a third, but less than two-thirds, so it would get the five points. Uh, previous grants, uh, if an applicant has never received a grant or guaranteed loan, then they get the 15 points. If they have not received a grant or guaranteed loan within the last two previous federal fiscal years, then they have five points. And if they have received a grant or guaranteed loan uh, within the past two fiscal years, they get zero points. Simple payback, which is um, calculated here a little bit differently for us uh, than the, the simple payback Scott used, but kind of the same things go, um, go into the mythology. Um, we're looking at eligible project cost divided by the dollar value of energy reduced or replaced. So uh, if a project has a payback of less than 10 years, it gets 15 points. Uh, if it has, if it's 10 years but um, not including 15, it gets 10 points. Excuse me, 10 points. And if it's 15 years up to and including uh, 25, it gets five points. And then longer than 25 years, uh, it would get no points. And then the last criteria is state director and administrator points. Um, this is where you want to enter into dialogue with the state that you're developing applications in. Um, what has the state director determined that they will award priority points? And you know, is there any way that your project uh, can contribute to those points? So uh, there's some things that uh, the, that the uh, regulation uh, looks at. The application is for an underrepresented technology. It can receive state director or administrator points. Selecting the application helps achieve geographic diversity. Say there's areas of the state that they have never done a uh, REAP grant or loan in. They may want to you know, try and entice some activity in that area. If the applicant is a member of an unserved or underserved population, they can award points. Um, 
if the app selecting the application helps further a presidential initiative or Secretary of Agriculture priority, um, they can award points. And if it's located in an impoverished area that has experienced long-term population decline or loss of employment, they can award points. So um, just to look at a couple of projects that we've done. Uh, before I took over coordinating in the, throughout the Midwest, I was um, Brenda's colleague in Minnesota. And these are some projects that we did uh, in Minnesota. This is a, a boiler project that we did for a greenhouse um, over in uh, eastern Minnesota. Uh, very successful. Um, uh, pellet mill uh, that we financed up in uh, central Minnesota, a couple pellet mills actually here, um, and there was some more components that we that we uh, worked with, and then you know just the small standalone uh, wood burners. Uh, this was also an eastern Minnesota project. Um, it was from someone who uh, did hardwoods, so they had a very aggressive payback because they already had the the wood available and. And uh, at least um, last I knew, they were very satisfied with it. Um, the last project is a project that uses uh, wood to fuel the uh, re reverse osmosis used in maple syrup processing. So those are just a few. I'm sure Brenda has uh, some very good examples of other projects, biomass projects that she has done uh, in Wisconsin. But um, I'm standing in for Brenda today. Um, this is Brenda's contact information. Uh, she is the energy coordinator in Wisconsin. Uh, so here's her contact information. And uh, if you need information on other energy coordinators or uh, are unable to get a hold of Brenda, um, my contact information is here also. Um, and then additional information uh, on the REAP program uh, can be found on this website. Uh, you will also find um, the applications that you need to apply. We talked about those three tier applications. Uh, so they are, they are posted here. Uh, and in addition, uh, Brenda or I could uh, provide those. So um, that wraps up uh, my portion of the presentation. Um, so Scott, I can turn it back to you. Okay. Does anybody have any uh, questions for either of us? You can either uh, chat them in the chat box, or um, if you're online, you can uh, blurt them out. I think I think we've got it, so people can. Yes, I think all the audios are on, so you could uh, just talk too. Well, I'm not hearing anybody jump in, so I uh, just remind you we've got this uh, series. So the um, the videos and slides are going to be on um, the uh, WisconsinEnergy.org site. So if you go under the learning, um, you can find the two uh, presentations we've already done. Uh, the videos are up there along with the slides, and uh, the videos for this one or the slides for this one ought to be up. Um, either tonight or tomorrow, and uh, um, well, uh, uh, probably the, the the video would be up by the first of next week. Uh, I got a question here, Lisa. Are there any grant funding for research feasibility studies? Yeah. Um, see, the 2008 Farm Bill added a feasibility study component to the REIT program, which um, we thought was great. It, you know, we um, we utilized all the funds each year, but the 2014 Farm Bill um, eliminated it. So REIT does not do any feasibility studies any longer. Um, so uh, that has somewhat left a void. Um, Especially where you know it's required as part of the applications for two hundred thousand or or greater. So, yep. Um, but Matthew, what I'd recommend is if it's a wood project, a wood energy project, uh, contact me because the U.S. Forest Service uh, will do uh, feasibility studies basically at no cost. Um, now I don't know if they would be applicable. Uh, what you'd need for the REAP grant, but we can. Uh, 
at least get you a number so you can figure out the, whether a study is worthwhile or not. And some of the tools we talked about earlier should help. And we do have a feasibility study guide that anyone is welcome to. Um, you know, when we when we look at feasibility studies, the things that we're looking for. Okay. Is that something online or something you could send me and I'll send out to the crowd? Absolutely. Okay. Well, I'm not seeing anybody else have any questions. Uh, looks like not. So um, somebody does have some questions, you can email it to us and we'll respond. Otherwise, we appreciate you uh, being on today. Thank you. Thank you.